Uh, I hope that uh, what I have to say will be of, of interest. Um, writing a family history is, is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time and uh, effort. I would say uh, I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to approach this because I didn't want to recite my family history. I'm not sure that you'd be particularly interested in that. Uh, but uh, in March uh, of this year, the New York Times Sunday uh, Times uh, book review section uh, was considered that they called it the memoir issue. And uh, uh, that they had a lot of books, uh, a, lot of, a lot of autobiographies and uh, various memoirs that were reviewed in that. And that gave me, an, uh, at least gave me some impetus to, uh, to think about writing this, uh, talking about this. And then uh, I, ca I came across a book review on, uh, on, believe it or not, the values of, uh, of uh, 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 end notes and uh, 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 indices in books and, and how they can be used. And the guy who wrote that uh, had written a book about uh, the adjective, if you find one, kill it. And uh, it sounded interesting. So I looked him up and it turns out he has written a book on, Kathy, it's not advancing. Next slide will not go. I'll try that. Okay. That's what you have to do. All right. So he wrote this book called uh, Memoir, a History. And uh, he put uh, the whole concept of memoir writing, autobiography, or multiple memoirs uh, in, in perspective. And uh, I thought I would approach my family history in the, in the, in the perspective or context of uh, what uh, Ben Yagoda wrote in, in his book. And uh, his comment, he has a couple of quotes which I think are appropriate for getting started. What everyone has in them these days is not a novel, but a memoir. Uh, Martin Amis, a famous uh, British author. And uh, no event is too small or too insignificant to write about, which is very definitely true, uh, by uh, Maureen Murdoch, whom I've never heard of, but who wrote a book about memory and memoirs. Uh, so writing uh, a memoir uh, is a broad field. It's one of the oldest forms of literature, apparently, uh, spanning the biblical times to the modern times. And uh, it takes many forms. The author of the book, uh, uh, Yagoda, says or seems to feel that the, the, in the Bible, the prophets are a good example of uh, memoirs. Uh, and uh, um, that, uh, that's one form. But you can see, for example, in the old days, uh, Julius Caesar's commentaries on the, on the Gallic Wars, uh, which we all, many of us who took Latin, uh, was a Latin II translation of, 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 uh, of that. Uh, Josephus uh, gave commentaries on the Jewish Wars uh, Marcus Aurelius Meditations, uh, uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine are all considered various forms of memoirs or commentaries. Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year in 1722 is an example of another form of uh, writing the journal. There are also letters and uh, poems, the speaker who spoke to us last week 
uh, on, on, on the colonial uh, witches uh, had interesting information about a member of her family. She did that in poetry, and, and that too is, is a, a form of, of uh, memoir or, or uh, at least family history. Uh, the, uh, there are all sorts of people write them, uh, clergy, celebrities, politicians, and just plain folk. Uh, William Barr just wrote one, one damn thing after another. He's not a celebrity, but a politician. James Baldwin, the notes of, of a native son. Frederick Douglass wrote two or three, actually. The, native, the, the narrative life of Frederick Douglass and later My Bondage, My Freedom. James Watson wrote The Double Helix, uh, all uh, commentary mem or memoirs, if you will. William Shirer wrote the uh, Berlin Diary of his time of what was going on sim simultaneously as he was living there in Berlin in the uh, lead up to the Second World War. They're also been written as novels. Uh, Marcel Proust in Search of Lost Time is, is a contemporary and continuous novel uh, about his experiences ongoing. Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man is a novelized form of commentary. James Thurber's My Life in Hard Times, Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Caged Birds Sing. Clarence Day wrote Life with Father and Cheaper by the Dozen, which we probably all saw as kids as movies, but they were in fact uh, the humorous stories of, of his life growing up. Catch-22 by Joseph Heller is uh, considered to be, uh, at least in, in uh, the author's mind, uh, a uh, somewhat semi-autobiographical. Uh, there are there is uh, there are collective memoirs. For example, uh, there are people who write who write stories about their their community, or or there are people who pull their information and write informations about memories of their towns. Uh, there are over 900 uh, memory books or Yiskor books from towns in uh, Poland and Eastern Europe where uh, the Nazis destroyed uh, the communities. And these, are, these, these were published between uh, the, the late 1940s and uh, 19, 1970. Uh, and then there are then there are uh, books that are not only the truth as fiction or commentary as written as fiction. There are downright uh, lies, if you will, or or false uh, uh, memoirs. For example, Jerzy Kozinski, who I believe won the the uh, National Book Award in the 80s for his book, The Painted Bird, which is supposed to be a bio his biography as a child uh, uh, in Eastern Europe uh, alone and how he got through, how he got through the wartime. Turns out that's total fiction, complete fiction. And uh, there was a book called The Education of Little Tree, which is a wonderful story written by a man named Forrest Carter. It, got, it was on the New York Times Book Review for a long, long time. Interestingly, turns out when it was, uh, when somebody looked up the author, turns out that his, he really was a man named Asa Carter, who was George Wallace's speechwriter during Wallace's time as uh, governor. And, uh, the story is complete fabrication, but a wonderful story, but but not anything to do with uh, with a real uh, memoir or or uh, autobiography. Now, the criticisms that are made of of uh, uh, biography, uh, uh, memoirs, and autobiography are that one it tends to 
point out that authors are obviously full of themselves and uh, are egotistical. Uh, they also point out that uh, they can, some of them consist of fabrications and many of them um, are related to uh, memory failure. And, and that seems to be the big criticism. So memory failure, what you're doing here is, is in, when you're writing a memoir or an autobiography or a family history, is you are writing, uh, you're writing history, uh, either con contemporary or uh, history uh, that goes into the past. And we all, um, we all have our uh, slips when it comes to that. Uh, J J Julian Barnes uh, wrote a very interesting book called The Sense of an Ending, and in it he has a quote that says, history is that certain uh, certainty produced at the point where the imperfections of memory meet the inadequacies of documentation. So we have, whenever we are writing history, we're, we're to some extent uh, uh, dealing with what we think happened, well, what we remember, uh, what we think we remember happened, but memory is uh, is very uh, a troublesome thing. Uh, there was an experiment that was uh, was carried out over a twenty year period. They uh, had a series of these uh, psychologists had a series of questions uh, uh, that they uh, uh, that they asked a, a group of. Uh, middle school students to uh, answer and uh, about certain things that, that were happening. And 20 years later, they gathered as many of those uh, the students back to re uh, to ask them about that, those tests that they underwent when they were in middle school. And they, the, their memory was terrible. They couldn't remember uh, most of what had happened. Um, well, for us as, at our age, I mean, I sometimes can't even remember what I had for breakfast or lunch. Uh, so we do, we do have to uh, realize that that uh, whatever we're whatever we're writing is really uh, based on our memory, what other people have told us what we've been able to look up. And as we know, facts are also um, uh, uh, questionable or certainly not always accurate. Uh, and so we're oftentimes writing opinion or a uh, point of view rather than, or our interpretation of what happened. And that can be, that can be somewhat uh, problematic. A good example, is, several examples, um, uh, Donald Trump wrote, wrote his book, The uh, Art of the Deal, uh, as, as sort of a I've got no sound. Yeah, I, I think we've lost the feed there. I yeah, I too have nothing. I thought it was me. Yeah, I, I, I three. <laughs> Maybe his wife had heard enough. <laughs> I sound. 
went off when he started talking about Donald Trump. Yeah, right, right. So the Zoom is still working because we are able to talk to each other. So I guess it's something at their end. I wonder if he realizes it. Maybe someone should text him. I did. Oh, great. I put it in the, te in the chat. Folks, we have a major meltdown. <laughs> uh, we figured you didn't like his talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to. And he didn't like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to look at his computer and it's totally dead. I have no clue oh. what happened. It's it's black and uh, maybe so, he can use maybe he can use yours, Kathy. Well, he would have to send me his PowerPoint, but he oh, can't do that. He can't do that because his computer is dead. I've checked. So tell him to forget. Things. Tell him to forget the PowerPoint and just go use yours and do it verbally. I mean, that's probably. Oh, the best. Nancy Pelosi has COVID. Oh. Mm. Could do that. Let me see what he thinks. I try a hard shutdown and see if that doesn't uh, let it get itself together. Yeah, always unplug it. Okay, hold on. He's coming. Are you on? Yeah. I'm very sorry. I don't know what happened. The computer just died. Power on and everything. I did it. So I'll try to continue without slides, which it's a bit of a problem, but um, we'll we'll try. Just as you uh, start to talk about Trump, is when it went mute. I uh, can't. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, as I was saying, uh, or as I think I was saying, we were writing. Writing history has uh, is more related to. Uh, our interpretation of things of what more than than the actual the actual fact and then when interpreting things uh, you don't always have the same two different people looking at the same series of events may come to very different conclusions uh, or have different uh, viewpoints certainly for example as I started to say Donald Trump wrote uh, the art of the deal well he didn't write it I mean he dictated it or somebody wrote it for him but then his niece has written a book which, which takes a whole different, total different viewpoint of the man. So two different people, two different, uh, two different points of view, and you will have to sort it out yourself. Now, when I wrote when I wrote our family history, which I wrote and was came was finished in 2020, uh, my brother and I had been talking about about our family life for a long time. I'm eight years older than he. And uh, our, our viewpoint, our view of our family life, of our family is, are totally different. Uh, I was pre-war, he was post-war in terms of dates of birth. Our family, the family in the eight years that I was alone with my mother mostly, was my father was in the army. Uh, was one way and my brother had a totally different view because 
things changed considerably after after the war. Uh, my father was struggling to get his practice restarted. My mother got ill. She died. My my brother had to deal with that. I was away in college. It was just it's like two different families. There was an old book that was written. My brother was an only child, and that's the way we we we, we get together. We were talking about well. Uh, it, our viewpoints were very different. So when I was writing, I had to take into consideration the different viewpoints because it was, it, it's not, it, it shouldn't just be my personal viewpoint, but it has to be tempered with going on, what was going on with, with other folks uh, in the family. So, uh, When we write, when we, I'm trying to think of the slide sequence because it, 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 it's a good read for me. Uh, so why actually, given all the problems with interpretation, why would one want to write a, 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 a family history or a memoir? Well, there are a lot of reasons people, people do it to try to straighten or, 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 or straighten out the, the facts of, of things. They want to get the story right. And they may have felt that what was written previously wasn't correct. They may want to puff themselves up. Um, they may want to write uh, a, a story about themselves. Uh, and I'm talking about autobiography here, but family history, autobiography, memoir, they're all of the same ilk. Uh, so, so they may want to puff themselves up, or they want to may make themselves younger than than they are, or it's an advertisement for themselves, or they <clears throat> may actually uh, want to know how many relatives they have and who they were, and are they related to anybody famous or anything like that. And uh, it's a it's a hard. There are many reasons for writing. Now. One thing is, if you're writing a, a, a history, a family history, to try to figure out how many relatives, or who your relatives are, you're going to have a problem because your direct relatives, your primary relatives, first degree relatives, uh, is, is an exponential issue. Every 25 years, you, uh, you have a new generation and approximately. So you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, 16 double great grandparents, and so it goes. And uh, by uh, a thousand years, which is uh, 40 generations, you would have more direct relatives than could possibly have existed on earth. So it, it contracts on itself. It, instead of being instead of being a, uh, a V that gets bigger and bigger, it's, it begins to contract in. Now, that, let's face it, you will still have the exponential number, but it won't be, it won't be infinite. It, uh, it, will, it will begin to crack and, and contract. And the reason for this has to do with uh, the development, the earth, the, the, the society. In 16, in the year 1000, for example, transportation was extremely limited. You could walk, you could ride a horse if you had one or a donkey or an ox or a cow, but more, more likely, uh, or an ox cart or something like that, but you couldn't go very far. Not unless you were, you know, one of the uh, barons' knights, and you went off to the uh, to the uh, uh, what do you call it crusades. But otherwise, you were pretty well limited. And towns and villages were rather small; they were not big, and they weren't that far apart. And so it was calculated. It is a very interesting study that was done in Science and published in nineteen. Uh, excuse me, 2018, you had, uh, the average distance between a husband and a wife, that is to say, the, the distance where the, the town from one and the town for the other 
was less than 10 kilometers. And from 1650, which is where this study was carried out, until about 1850, when railroads began to uh, develop, uh, that was it, uh, about 10 kilometers on average, uh, occasionally a little bit more, but not much. And uh, they estimated that 80% of, um, of your uh, of families or marriages were between second cousins or closer. So uh, the gene pool wasn't wasn't dr dramatic, uh, uh, wasn't wasn't widespread either because everything was was close at hand, and uh, there were limits to where you could where you could live. And um, but over time. Uh, we dispersed, uh, and now now they estimate that roughly uh, you're about one, you're about no, it's, well the estimation about how many you know are you are you six cousins six cousins to everybody, which you know six degrees of separation. It turns out that the calculation is you're more like a 15th cousin to uh, people in your cultural milieu and in the world about a 50th cousin. So there you go. And about 1% of your gene pool uh, with, uh, in the 10th gen from the 10th generation is what, what, you, what you inherit a, a little bit less than 1%. So trying to trying to find out famous find famous relatives, you've got a whole bunch of folks that you have to find, and that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, now we do we do spread we do spread out. Uh, uh, our families don't stay in one place. And consequently, uh, as we spread out, uh, our families become less and less connected. It's a sort of a centrifugal force uh, uh, that affects us all. In my family, uh, in which I have information going back to about 1800, uh, in Europe, in small area in Eastern Europe, was where our where our family seems to have uh, arisen, uh, as best I can tell. And now, uh, what is it, 1800 to 2000, 200, and, uh, 200 plus years, we have, we're, we're now in Australia, we're in, uh, uh, Canada, we're in all different parts of the United States. We don't know that many, you know, a lot of them we don't know. And as part of my writing uh, exploration, uh, I discovered some Australian cousins that I met when I was nine or 10 years old and never again. Uh, uh, Remet them and got some interesting history from them, uh, and learned a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, we do spread out, and we do want to. And this is a way writing family histories of trying to pull people together, uh, bring people back together to know who we are, where we came from, and our kids, for example, they don't know their California cousins. Uh, they've never met them. Um, and so we become strangers and trying to reduce that uh, to make, give them a sense of place. And also to let them know where, you know, what we were back, way back when, you know, we may be, we may be uh, a, in a very different economic and social situation than we were uh, 100 or 200 years ago. And uh, it, it might be interesting and useful for our grandchildren and even our children 
uh, oh, the slides are back. What happened? Uh, and now, so uh, now I got to figure out how to move this. Again, uh, Catherine, I don't seem to be able to move the slides. Wait, no, this is. I'm sharing your screen. It's... You cannot move them on my screen. Come to your laptop. Come to my laptop. Sorry, this is a migratory pattern. We're doing a family history. We're dealing with migration. So maybe I'll get to where I want to be. Can you hear me? You're muted. I'm still muted. Did you click on something? I clicked on thing that said unmute. I, I hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can right. hear you. Okay. Good. So, as I said, we row our boats forward as we move through life, but we're looking backwards all the time. And hopefully by looking, looking backwards and finding out more about our past, we will have a better sense of um, uh, how our future will play out. So I wrote this memoir, Photographs and Memories, which was finished in 2020, but I've actually written three memoirs in different forms. The, the mostly Paris memoir uh, is a book of photographs. And given that that is what the way the person who's doing the photographs and writing the commentary uh, is really telling them, telling you about themselves or you're seeing how the other person sees. And that's sort of a memoir in a way. The second one was a commissioned uh, book uh, by my division director, the Division of Nephrology, the history of our Division of Nephrology from 1958 to 2008, 50 years. And I was part of that for, 48 of them. No, not quite 48, but not at the begin very beginning, but I have a part in the development of this. And so I'm in here uh, and uh, in a small way, uh, this sort of tells you about my professional life. And this uh, Photographs and Memories is about family life and the history as best I could work it out. Well, if you're going to write a family history, then there are a lot of things you may need. Uh, the first is time and patience. And the second is access to your to family and friends who knew your who knew you, knew your family, knew your parents, and even older folks who may have known your grandparents and so on. Because uh, uh, you may not have direct access to that. And when you were little, you don't really pay that much attention to your, uh, the stories of your, of your grandparents. Uh, you may not, only what you remember. And so you need a, a lot of help when you're gonna need photographs and a lot of documents, birth certificates, death certificates, obituaries, paper, uh, newspaper clippings if you have them, 
marriage certificates, information regarding travel, passports. Um, if you come from other, another country, then you may need citizenship data, immigration data, and then uh, genealogy searches. Is, and those are fraught. But these are three. There's uh, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, which is the Mormons. They have a huge uh, repository of information. Ancestry.com can be helpful. And uh, JewishGenealogy.com can be helpful. These all cost. You get a, a little bit of a free tickler, but they they charge you for their for their uh, for access to the real to the real information. And there are tons of these ancestry ancestry uh, um, organizations uh, around uh, that you can access. Uh, but you you've got to be careful because there's a lot of uh, misspelling of names that occur, uh, changes of names. Uh, you get from the early immigration stuff, uh, the, the immigration officers often couldn't pronounce the uh, immigrants' names and so they got misspelled or even changed for that matter. Uh, and, and so tracking backwards can be an issue. When I looked up my grandfather on, uh, on, uh, am, on Ancestry, I found, uh, I found him and I found uh, his wife, my grandmother and my father, but my father's name was uh, misspelled. And, um, and so you, you have to be real careful. Uh, I keep on. Okay. Uh, first thing that you want to deal with and get your hands on are photographs. Uh, we were fortunate that we saved everything. My, my parents kept a, a family uh, album and we have uh, photographs of our family that go back 130 years, which is uh, quite nice. The problem is that the note, the, the, the album has disintegrated and fallen apart. The pictures have come loose from their uh, moorings in the book. Uh, and so you have a whole bunch of photographs, uh, oftentimes unnamed, unlabeled, and uh, uh, you have to pick, pick them out and Put them together, or help, or get help to help you. We are older people who remember uh, these these folks. Uh, it behooves you to label them or find the labels if you can. And so, for example, this is my grandfather in uh, 1902, and this is my great great grandfather. Who knows when? Maybe 1870 or 1880. Uh, but having that is very important. And, and in, in my uh, family history, where we have a photo, photo gallery, uh, we are fortunate that we have uh, my mother and my grandfather and uh, a lot of our family from when they were very, very young. My mother at two months of age, three months of age, all the way up to uh, the year of her death. Uh, 48 years later, my father also through his lifetime and several of our, my grandparents. So you have an opportunity to trace, trace them through their lifetime and you can tell stories that way. Well, having figured out who they are and something about them, because it's not just writing a history of this person had these children and they had these children and just giving a, a sort of a a genesis, uh, a, a recitation of names which have no meaning, just as these pictures have no meaning to anybody who doesn't know anything about them, you want to give them, you want to give them a personality, you want to find out who they were, what they did, why they did it. Uh, my grandparents came from uh, Poland. They came by way of uh, England, actually, uh, they, they stayed in England for a couple of years before they came to the United States. And this is the manifest, manifest of their 
uh, crossing in September of, 2000, of 1905 on the SS New York. And here, which you can't read, but uh, which I know is the manifest. This is where they are, my grandmother, my grandfather, the kids, except for my father who was born here. Uh, and then who greeted them and who was going to be responsible for them when they got here. So they got here uh, and they were fortunate they got here because well, this was a huge migration and uh, 70,000 people, well, not 70,000, 20, 20, 20 million people came to the United States between 1870 and 1920. And that represented something like 30% of the entire population of the United States in, in 1870. Uh, and in 1923, they put a they created they, they created a an immigration law which basically stopped immigration. It was very very hard. They put quotas on it, and people who who tried to get in the United States after uh, 1924 were basically screwed. Particularly if they were coming from uh, Eastern Europe, Poland, uh, excuse me, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Italy, and Greece. Uh, and that was um, that was unfortunate, but most of my family came early, which was fortunate. Um, my grandmother became a citizen in 1940. She must have had uh, a premonition about what well, she was concerned about being not being uh, uh, not being a citizen, although she'd lived here for 35 years. So she got citizen, she became a citizen. I don't know if my grandfather, her, her husband, uh, ever became a citizen or if he became a citizen earlier, but she's the only one I've got papers for. And uh, just as an interesting aside, I just noticed today when I was looking at this that they don't have race on here, they have color. And that's what they, you know, skin color is not race, but interesting uh, that, they, that they weren't talking about race back in uh, 1905, or actually in 1940. Um, she also cheated on her age. She was older than that, but they apparently didn't, weren't concerned. Where did they come from? And I have a map, so you want to get maps of where people came from. If you, if you're, now many of you may have uh, may have come to the United families may have come to the United States in uh, you know 1700 or whatever early, and so you may not need this kind of maps, but you know you may need maps uh, for where where the villages and towns were where they originated. So this is a map of a small town in Poland uh, where my maternal grandparents came from. This is a map of the Ludge region, uh, uh, which was a small town where my paternal grandparents lived, lived here. Uh, my gr grandmother rather lived here and her family, but it was a real small town then. Now it's with this time that when the map was made, it was a very big industrial city. And this is where we think my paternal grandparents came from. So it gives you a sense of place. And then they came here and then became citizens. And that sort of tells a story uh, of their migratory pattern. I, I mean, there's a lot more to fill in, but getting these documents can be, can be very useful and very helpful and time consuming. We were lucky. Uh, we kept a lot of junk. My parents did. My father did. He was uh, he was instrumental in getting a lot of information when he was a young man. So he started the process, and I more or less continued it, except I put it in writing, and he just sort of passed it along uh, in various letters of and stuff like that, which I fortunately, which he saved, and which I fortunately saved as well. Now, I told you earlier that there are different, time, different forms of uh, 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 memoir writing. And one of them is the collective, uh, 
the collective history, a collective history of, of, of where you came from, where you're, where you're, or of your village. And we happened to have one. I was given one uh, by a relative who had more than one. And these are hard to come by. There are 900 uh, Yiskor books or memory books of towns that uh, were destroyed um, or, uh, uh, during the Second World War. And uh, we had one. Uh, there, you can find them. There's a collection of them in the Duke uh, University Library. There's, uh, you can find a couple in the, in the various Holocaust museums and in, in the, in the big one in Washington. Uh, this is the book, uh, the Sefer uh, Visegrad, which is the Visegrad book. This is a, 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 a small, a picture of a, of a small portion of the town. And this is a, the picture of the inside of the temple, which was uh, fairly, uh, fairly ornate. And going through the book, I found a picture of my grandfather's, my paternal, my maternal grandfather's, either his grandmother or great grandmother, who um, is somewhat celebrated and it was celebrated in the community because she uh, would tell them about uh, the Napoleonic armies going through the town on their way to Russia. And she was born in 1801 and died in 1914. So she was really old. Uh, and uh, this was translated or partially translated by several people here by uh, um, uh, Esther Brown, Max uh, Herzl, and uh, uh, Max Steinmetz. So I was very appreciative of getting that help. And this young man was a first cousin of my mother's who was born in the States, uh, but her, his parents also came from this town and he was killed uh, in the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. So he got a, a mention. Uh, so you never know where you're gonna find information. Uh, in, in terms of getting information, as I started writing this book, I got, I got put in contact with uh, a cousin whom I did not know, although I, I may have met once who lives in San Antonio. And he put me in touch with a cousin whom I never met, but whose father I met when I was about eight or nine years old. And uh, uh, he's, they live in Australia. And I was able to get a hold of a, of a family history, not a family history, a personal history that he wrote uh, from uh, about the, his birth from 1910 until 1949 when he was uh, 39 years old and, and left Europe for Australia. And uh, it was a fascinating story of a man who never was in the concentration camp and who was a, a wheeler dealer, uh, he was a trader. He was in the, um, he was in the uh, um, sausage casing business and, and also making sausage. And, and he traveled on trains throughout Europe during the, during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how he did it. I have another uh, cousin who did the same thing. Uh, and he settled in Australia and apparently did remarkably well. You find these things out. And consequently, when you've done, when, after you've gotten all this information together, one of the things you want to do, or you'd like to do, is make a family tree. And this is really, you end up having to make four family trees because you do one for your maternal family, you do one for your paternal family. And this is just one for my paternal family. And uh, they had big families back then, eight, 10 kids. So my, this is my grandfather's family here. And he had one, two, three, four, five. He had six sibs. My grandmother, his wife had eight sibs. And going back uh, 
a gener another generation in her family, another eight sibs. So it's a huge group of people to try to track down and find. And, and we, were able to, we were able to do it through various contacts. And also as a consequence of the fact that my father, when he was a young man, actually sat down with family members and asked them all these questions and put together a tree, which interestingly enough, I got another one from an Australian cousin which pretty well matched this with a few minor changes. So you want to do that, uh, and that can be that can be somewhat embarrassing at times because, as I said, family members uh, you may have uh, parents who were second cousins, and my parents were second cousins, uh, um, and uh, you know it, it's you, you begin to wonder. Uh, my it turns out that my my uh, Mater my my mater grandmother uh, and my grandfather on the other side of the family are related uh, also. So it's, it's in these small communities uh, with limited motion, limited movement uh, in terms of ability to travel, you are, you are somewhat uh, limited in who you get to meet socially anyway. Uh, so having done all that, you've got to write it. You want to write it? What format do you want? What do you want to put in it? How much, what do you want to leave out? Is there anything you, you, you don't want people to know or shouldn't know? Uh, for example, I, I was asked several times while I was writing this whether I could give people uh, a medical history of the family. Now, uh, as a physician, I had a lot of information about people and, and what diseases they had uh, and what problems they had, particularly in my parents' family and in my grandparents' family. But I decided that I couldn't do that because maybe somebody didn't want whatever health problem they had to be known. And, and I didn't want to, uh, if, they, if they requested, I would give it to them, but otherwise, uh, I don't know who would be offended, and I just wanted to avoid that. So, what format do you want? Do you want to, do you want to do a book? Do you want to have it hardcover, soft cover? Do you want a dust jacket? Do you want to do it as an ebook? Do you, do you want to just put it in a in a, in a, uh, a Word document and a PDF file on a jump drive and 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 give it to whomever. Who do you want to give it to? That's another thing. Do you want to have it as a video narrative with somebody interviewing you and you giving them the information as you answer questions? Do you want to write it yourself or do you want someone else to write it or ghost write it? Uh, and if it's going to be a book, then what size book, what kind of paper, the type, how it's going to be organized, how it's going to be distributed? All of those are interesting questions and uh, have come up on several occasions, actually on previous occasions when I did the other books. You may not want to do a book. You may just want to keep it, keep the information for yourself and, and uh, just tell it as stories. I got help. I uh, wanted to do things in, in a quote unquote professional way. And so, whoops, yes. And so I used this company called Modern Memoirs which I discovered uh, had a small ad in the New Yorker uh, years ago when I did the photo book. And they were easy to work with. Uh, they weren't cheap by any means, but they were easy to work with. And I worked with them for all three books and uh, was, was very pleased. So I'm sorry about the, the, uh, the disruption it, it sort of put me off a little bit in terms of uh, what I was, how I was going to say things, but I did get a chance to, to uh, at least you could see some of the slides. So I'll stop here and be happy to answer any, uh, any questions that anybody uh, might have. When you do something like that, 
and it's distributed to family members or whoever. Yeah. Do you suddenly get a rush of additional information and you think, oh my God, I've got to revise it already? Well, you know, that, that happens because information comes in, somebody realizes you're writing something and, and they pull together stuff that they have and give it to you. Or somebody may have written a family history. I mean, look, Andy, you're, uh, you may have a, a, a brother or maybe you have a, a family member, or maybe, a, maybe your father, let's say, wrote something. And just like I'm writing something, I hope that my, as I ended the thing, I said, I hope that you will continue this, that you will uh, uh, get more pictures and, and write a, you know, a volume two, if you will, because it should be a continuum. I would have to tell you that the story about the Australian uh, guy who was traveling through Europe all during the war, uh, how I don't know, I got that after the book was finished. But it would, it would make a fascinating uh, story by itself. There's always more information, Andy. There's always something that you don't know. Right. Now it may be easier for folks who were, whose families uh, several gen for several generations back uh, came to the United States, people who were uh, who've been here since since the beginning or close to the beginning, and uh, maybe it's it's easier, it'll be easier or less difficult to find find information about about that. Uh, than it is trying to get information from folks who've come over from Europe, particularly at the time of the, um, around in the 30s and 40s, uh, disrupted by war, damage to uh, documents, and having to find documents uh, that way is, is extraordinarily difficult. And uh, lucky, uh, somebody, somebody told me, uh, two people in my family told me that we, we are related to Rashi, who was a, 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 a Jewish um, uh, rabbi uh, commentary on the, on the Bible, uh, a major commentary, commentator on the Talmud, and who lived in France uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the 13th century. Now, as far as I can tell, there, there is no conceivable way that uh, that that I could ever document that. So it, it's an interesting uh, uh, thought, but it, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, buy it as the truth. What was the reaction of your grandchildren uh, when they saw this book? Uh, well. They're teenagers, or they were. They're gradually getting out of the teenage years. Uh, two of them have read it. I can't say, but the other two younger ones may not have yet. But they all got copies. And uh, did it I start a new line of questioning for you? Excuse me. Do they have many questions for you? Uh, not not yet, and they can't wait too long. <laughs> well, it's wonderful that you did this. You I know, think that's you, for your family. You do, you do it for yourself, really, in a way. You hope that it influences or gives other people perspective, but it certainly gives you perspective. You know, you go through life, uh, things are happening, and you, you're aware of them, but many times you don't really stop and think much long, for a long, any period of time to put it in perspective. And uh, it really, uh, it really is uh, enlightening to do it. Not just because of the facts, but you have to put your whole family in perspective. You know, um, why did my grandparents decide to come to the United States in 1905, for example, or maybe slightly earlier than that because they left Poland earlier? Why did they do that? Uh, I found out why. <laughs> 
probably to escape the pogroms that were happening in Europe. I know that uh, my parents uh, left uh, from, well, uh, well parents left from Russia to go to Canada because Canada was offering free passage uh, because they wanted to settle the West. So they gave free passage to uh, folks who wanted to get over to Canada. Well, I found, I found three reasons why my grandparents, at least my, my paternal grandparents came to the United States. The first reason was uh, the pogroms, which were frequent, and that was all related in, in, in large part to the turmoil in Europe at that time. The second reason was uh, Russia was uh, uh, actively uh, drafting young men to fight in, in the upcoming Russo-Turkish, Russo-Japanese uh, Russo yep. war. And that was a 12 year enlistment, which was not favorable and my grandfather didn't like that. And the third reason, which was an interesting one, which was a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law disagreement. Uh, my, apparently my, my grandfather's, uh, my paternal grandfather's mother was extremely, extremely religious, extremely orthodox. And my, and my grandmother, her daughter-in-law was a free thinker and really claimed she was an atheist, but she wasn't really. But the, the bottom line was that was a, a friction that could not be overcome. And so they left. <laughs> you find out all these little things when you, when you ask. <laughs> well. It certainly was a fascinating undertaking that you did, and uh, I enjoyed hearing all about your family and how you researched everything. Well, it it was it was interesting. I even I even discovered uh, that we had a, a couple of uh, well known family members. Uh, one uh, was a guy named Harold Schoenberg, who was the music uh, critic, the yeah. senior music critic at the New York Times for a long time and Pulitzer Prize winner. There was an artist by the name of Adolf Gottlieb, who was a uh, well-known American ex uh, expressionist, uh, has, exhibit, has exhibited all over and has works in the Metropolitan Museum, Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I never met him. I never heard of him, but my father knew him, and uh, like that. But that's you know, that's all. By the way, that's not that critical because I couldn't say a whole lot about them. I don't know them personal. Didn't know them personally. Well. Okay. If there's no more questions, we'll. Um... We'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.